Hallelujah. Praise you, Lord. We're here at Jesus is Lord Ministry International. I'm Wayne Mosser, bringing the message to you today. It is October the 2nd in 2024, and we're doing the 2 p.m. service here. And if you have your Bibles with you, please turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 9. Ecclesiastes 4, 9. Let's pray. Father, I just pray that today that I would bring glory to you, Father, and glory and honor and praise to you through the message that I'm going to bring today. And Father, I just pray when the people look at this message that they don't see Wayne, but they see Jesus. And Father, we just pray that you get all the glory today. And, and Holy Spirit, give me the words to say. If you have something to add to or take away from this message, you have free reign to do so. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're at Ecclesiastes 4, 9, and it starts out, Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him that is alone when he falleth, for he hath not another to help him. Again, if two lie together, then they have heat. But how can one be warm alone? And if one prevail against him, two shall withstand him. And a threefold cord is not quickly broken. So we see there in verse 9 that two is better than one. Now, I, I think that when he was speaking here, uh, he was talking about a man and a wife, um, husband and wife. Uh, but it also pertains to other things, too. And then in the next verse, it says, if one would fall, the other can lift them up. But then at the end there, it says a threefold cord is not quickly broken. Now, there was different definitions for that, but I feel that that's talking about if when you're married and you have Jesus and you're married or God in your marriage, that's the threefold cord. You got the husband and the wife and you got God. So that's threefold. In Genesis 2, 18, and it says, And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helpmeet for him. So when God was doing creation, he made man, and he made, well, first of all, he made all the animals and everything, and then he made man, and then he seen that it wasn't good for man to be alone and he's seen that the animals were not suitable companions for him. That, in other words, they couldn't help him accomplish what he needed to do in life. So God then created woman, and uh, the two of them became one. Um, so, man and wife. Uh, I met my wife. 49 years ago. We've known each other for 49 years. We've been married um, 43 years. Let's see. Yes, 43 years. 43 long years. She's back there laughing right now. <laughs> but anyway, we have our little things where we help cheer each other up. Like when the one starts to criticize the other, we get the chainsaw out and we start cutting at that beam in the other person's eye, the one that's doing the criticizing, and say, here, let me help you get the beam out of your own eye. You know, just little things like that, you know, that, that help you from getting into arguments. You know what I'm saying? And... Uh, and she has one when she sees someone doing something, a, a man doing something stupid or doing something mean. or And there was a certain person she used to say this about, but I'm not going to say it, who it was. But she says to me, if you ever act like that, 
I know we took the vows, death to us part. Till death do we part. She said, one of us is going to be parting, and it's not going to be me. So it was her friendly way of telling me to not act like that. So anyway, over the years, we, we, uh, we had our struggles, but all together, it's been good. So it's good for two people to be together. Um, in Proverbs, it says, whosoever, Proverbs 18, 22, whosoever findeth a wife, findeth a good thing, and obtaineth favor of the Lord. Now, I quote the one, sometimes it's better to be on the, the roof of a dripping or listen to the dripping of the rainy roof or something like that. Than, uh, but anyway, I digress. That wasn't in my message. I don't know how I went there. But anyway, whoever finds a wife finds a good thing. So in other words, you can help each other. Like if one of you is sick, the other one can help take care of them. And, and you know, that's went both ways in the, the last five years. I was sick for a while, and, and now my wife, then my wife was sick. And uh, I have fully recovered, and she's on the way of recovery uh, over these sicknesses. Um, it's also good for encouragement, to encourage each other when, when you get down. Or it's good for security reasons, to have two people or support but as it says in Genesis, to have a helper. Now that goes both ways. I have a helper, but she also has a helper. Because as it says in Ecclesiastes 4.10, for if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow. Now it's also important to have a ministry partner. I know that that was talking about a partner for life, but... When you're in the ministry, it's good to have a partner, not only a spouse, but also another brother, if you're, a, if you're a man, or if you're a woman, to have another sister to help you do ministry together. Sometimes you don't have that husband or wife that you can team up and do it together. It's good to have uh, someone to minister together in Mark 6, 7, uh, this is Jesus talking, and he called unto him the twelve and began to send them forth two and two and gave them the power over unclean spirits. So whenever you're going out and ministering, it's good to have two people. Um, it it uh, makes you stronger and, and, and encouragement uh, especially when you're uh, street witnessing or something like that and someone rejects you, it's good to have a fellow brother there with you to help encourage you and to strengthen your spirit. Now, I know that the boldness comes from the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit gives you the ability to witness, but sometimes the Holy Spirit uses other people to help encourage you, okay? Sometimes the Holy Spirit might be talking through you to encourage someone else, or sometimes he uses someone else to encourage you. So it's always important to have that second person. In Luke 10, a little bit further on in Jesus' ministry, Luke 10, 1, it says, After these things the, appoint, the Lord appointed 70 also and sent them two and two before his face into every city and place whither he himself would come. Therefore he said unto them, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye. I'm going to come back to that one, pray ye. Therefore, the Lord of the harvest, that he would send forth laborers into his harvest field. You notice he sent them out two by two. He didn't send them out singly. He didn't send them out four on four or eight with eight. He sent them two by two. 
Now, I wonder why he did it by twos. Well, for one thing, it says that when you pray and two of you agree as touching any one thing here on earth, it would be done for you by my Father in heaven. So two is good, better than one. But why not four or eight? Well, the thing is, now we've done some street ministry, and I'm going to get into that a little bit later. But if you've got eight people walking up to one person, they sort of get defensive. If it's only two people, well, then they're apt to listen to you a little bit more. But if a whole crowd comes up to them, they reject, a lot of times they want to reject you. So that's why I think he only sent two at a time, because he didn't want a whole crowd going up and intimidating people that they would run away. Acts 13.1 is a good example. It says, Now, and this was the, the church um, that was at Antioch. It says, Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teacher. I won't be able to pronounce all these names, but it was a bunch of prophets and teachers there. Barnabas, Simeon, Niger, Lucius, Cyrene, Man Manum, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. And they ministered to the Lord and fasted. So they were ministering. They were praising God. They were praying. They were fasting. And the Holy Spirit said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So see, here we go again. They sent them in a pair to go on a mission trip to do ministry work. And this is the first uh, missionary trip that Paul and Barnabas took together, or it says here, Saul, who later his name is changed to Paul. But notice they said there that they fasted and prayed and then sent them away. You know, back several years ago, it's been almost, uh, I guess, 20 years now, uh, Kathy, that, that's my wife's name, and myself, we started an organization called Brown Bags and Blankets. And what we did was we took a brown bag meals to the homeless and handed out blankets. That's what it started as. And uh, we went to D.C. And for three years, it was okay. We started giving out some coats and some hats and gloves and socks. It started to grow a little bit, but for three years, nothing really happened. We talked to some people and, and everything, and now we would pray going down the road, but it seemed like we didn't have many results. But in the fourth year, uh, as it grew, as we grew a little bit, and we included Frederick in on um, this ministry, we had a team that stayed back behind that would pray for us as we went down. Before, yes, we prayed while we were on the way and we would pray while we were down there, but then we started getting teams that prayed for us the whole time while we were ministering down in D.C., or Frederick. Well, then things started to happen after prayer. You know, we prayed for more workers and we got more workers. We prayed for a building. We got a building. Uh, we prayed for different things. This is the prayer circle that we would have um, 
in between services, uh, in between ministry trips, I should say, but the team that stayed back while we were praying, we started seeing salvations, we started seeing healings, and we started seeing miracles. And I'm going to um, expand on them miracles next week because as I was going over this this morning, the Lord give me my next week's message, and it's going to be on prayer. So I'm going to tell you some of the miracles and things that happened uh, while we were ministering down there. And some of the homeless actually come off the street. They got jobs, and they um, got homes of their own either apartments or, or whatever. And it was all because of that prayer. Now I wanted to say because of that prayer, people started to come on board. And I'm going to mention a couple names because I know they watch my sermons. So I'm going to give a shout out to them because uh, they were faithful in this ministry and they're faithful at watching um, my, my messages that I give. And one of them is my sister. Uh, her name was, is Margie Baker. Now, we was making a brown bag lunch, sandwich, cookies, crackers, a juice, and oh, a fruit or something like that, and put it all in a brown bag. Well, my sister said, and she was, she's a caterer, and she said, I can make you a hot meal cheaper than that brown bag meal that you're taking them. So she started, it was around the third or fourth year, she started making our meals for us. And every time we went out to minister, for the next eight or nine years, however long she'd done it, she was a part of every trip that we took, with maybe the exception of one or two when she was out, she went out west with her sons. <clears throat> but she was involved with every trip. She she was involved with more trips than me and Kathy was involved because we didn't go every time. There were so many people that wanted to go, we had to take turns going so that everyone could help. We could only take eight people at a time. And we had a lot of people wanting to go and help do this. Another person who was a good prayer warrior, and she gives me a thumbs up almost every week on my messages, was Beth Forrest. Now, Beth, she was a prayer warrior, and she was faithful to go out, and because of her prayers, some of these things happen. And her son, Nick, went with us. He would have went with us every trip to D.C., but I couldn't take him every time because, like I said, we could only take eight people at a time, and there was like 20-some people that wanted to go with us. So we had to make some of them stay home. But Nick, man, he wanted to go every time. Now, he wasn't so much interested in the trips that we'd done to Frederick, but he wanted to go to D.C. every time. So uh, they were some of the people that went with us and that prayed for us and that helped us in this ministry. But anyway, getting back to two is better than one. Whenever we would go to D.C., there was big parks that these homeless people would be in, and I'd send the guys out two at a time in, in groups of two, and they would go, and, and one would say, ask them what they needed, their physical needs, and the other one a lot of times would pray for their spiritual needs. And so while the one was there with the physical needs, he'd be calling us back in the van saying, we need two meals, we need socks, we need a coat, 
this size coat and you know and then I'd send someone off to uh, deliver the stuff so that's the way we did it we had did it two by two going through the park or in Frederick we would actually go into their camps and their camps would be back into the woods and stuff and we usually went two people at a time because it helped you with boldness and delivering the gospel message it seemed like it made it easier if it was two of you so we always sent them off two by two now this organization and this was through prayer we had over 200 people helping going in the 11 years I think we counted over 200 people that went and it was at least 30 and I might be um, estimating this light but I didn't want to be a liar so there was at least 30 organizations that helped support us including things that were not Christian organizations but God put it in their heart to help us and I'll get into more detail on that how prayer helped this come along next week but because today I'm talking on two is better than one. So anyway, in Acts 15, 36, it says, and this is the group meeting again, that same group that sent Paul and Silas out, or it might not have been the same group, but it was another group, and they were there praying. And it said, in some days after, Paul said unto Barnabas, let us go again and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they do. And Barnabas determined to take with them John, whose surname was Mark, but Paul thought not good to take him with them who departed from them from Pamphylia and went not with them to the work. And the contention was so sharp between them that they departed asunder, in other words, they separated one from the other. So Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus, and Paul chose Silas and departed, being rep recommended by the brethren unto the grace of God. So Paul and Barnabas was going to go on another trip. Barnabas wanted to take John Mark. Well, the previous trip, John Mark was with them part of the trip but he left for some reason. It doesn't say in the Bible why he left, but he didn't finish the trip with them. Now, this first trip probably took a year to do. So, you know, I don't know if he got homesick or if he wasn't feeling well or, or what the reason, but he didn't finish the trip. So Paul didn't want to take him the next time. Well, the disagreement was so bad that they split. But see what the devil means for bad, God can turn it around for good. So now instead of having one ministry team, they got two ministry teams. Barnabas took John Mark and Paul took Silas. So instead of one team of two, now there's two teams of two. And there's other people that probably went with them, but they were the two the, the main ones, because we know Luke went with Paul because he records what Paul does from there, there on. So, um, so anyway, getting back to the brown bags and blankets, you know, after doing it for 11 years, we felt the Lord calling us out of that to do something different. So it was a time for us to rest and relax and and uh, spend time with God to see what the next adventure that he has for us to do. Well, right now I'm preaching here, but I don't know if this is going to be where he wants me to do full time or if he has other places that he wants me to go. But others, some of the others that we had trained are still doing street ministry and they're still working with the homeless. So out of them 200 people that we had taken with us, 
there is some still continuing it on. Now they didn't continue it right away, but they've gone back and now they are um, ministering to the homeless. Uh, I had met one of them and that was uh, Beth that I men mentioned earlier and she told me how they are ministering to the homeless down in Frederick now. 2 Corinthians 6.14 says, Be ye not unequally yoked together. Now, this is talking about um, don't be yoked excuse me, but don't be paired up with an unbeliever. So in other words, a believer shouldn't be paired up with a non-believer. Uh, uh, a believer shouldn't marry a non-believer. Uh, a believer shouldn't go into business with a non-believer. But I'm going to use it a little bit differently. Be not unequally yoked together. In other words, when you're looking for a ministry partner to do ministry with, someone you can hook up with, you need someone with the same spiritual goals. Now, it don't necessarily have to be someone that's on the same spiritual level as you, but they need to have the same passions, the same heart. They need to be, you need to be in one accord. So in other words, you need to be in agreement with what you're doing. So back, getting back to the brown bags and blankets. Uh, my ministry partner was my wife. We was both in agreement. This is what the ministry is going to be. One, we wanted them homeless people to have a home after they died. We wanted them to know Jesus. We wanted them to be able to meet Jesus and enter into heaven. Two, we wanted to train people to be able to minister. A lot of those people that we'd taken with us had never ministered before. They come from churches that only the pastor done the ministry. Some of them didn't even know how to pray for people. I, I give a, a, a class or so with how to lead people to the Lord and how to pray for people. And then third, we wanted the homeless people to get off the street. So that was our three goals. So that was our main three goals, that the homeless would have a home after this life, that we could train people to do ministry, and three, that we could bring, help bring the homeless off the street. And we accomplished all three of those goals. Now, maybe not to the extent that we would have liked to have, but we did do it on a small scale. In Psalms 27, 17, it says, Iron sharpeneth iron, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. Well, I had a friend, and I guess I can still say he's my friend. We don't have contact with each other too much anymore. His name's Pat Clady. And Pat Clady, I know you watch this once in a while because you give me a thumbs up. When I first changed my life around, I drug Pat Clady along with me. And eventually he turned his life around. And we ministered together for years. And one helped the other. Now, I might have been a little bit further advanced in my walk with Jesus than what he was at first, but I would help pick him up. I'd help encourage him. But then sometimes he would help pick me up. You see, it says in Ecclesiastes 4.10, for if one would fall, the other one would lift him up. Also, God said in Isaiah 35, 3, Strengthen ye the weak hands, and confirm the feeble knees. Say to them that are fearful of heart, Be strong, and fear not. When you have two together, 
the stronger one helps the weaker one. But not always is the same person the stronger one. In other words, you might be stronger in one thing, but your friend could be stronger in another. So that's why it's helpful to have two, because you can always help lift each other up. One might have a stronger gift or might be gifted in one thing, or the Holy Spirit might work better through one than the other in one thing and then the other one in something else. Sometimes the one might be gifted more in evangelism and the other one might be gifted more in faith and healing and things like that. Luke 22, 31 says, this is Jesus talking to Peter or Simon before Jesus' death. And Jesus said to Simon, he said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee that thy faith not fail. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. We need to strengthen each other. That's an important thing. In Galatians 6, 1, it says, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. So in other words, don't think that you're so high above, high and mighty, that you can't fall for the same sin that your brother fell for. You need to encourage him, but be careful while you're encouraging him that you don't belittle him or anything. It says, bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. When I read that, I'm thinking the law of Christ well, one of the things Jesus told Simon, right up there above there, he said, when you are converted, strengthen thy brethren. So that was a commandment that Jesus gave us, to strengthen your brother, to love one another, to help, and, and don't condemn. We need to help lift each other up. You know, it's always... Uh, a saying goes that Christians is the only army that kill their wounded. You know, when someone is wounded, when someone has fallen, we need to help them. We need to lift them up, help them back into the fold so that they can continue on with the fight, not stump on them and kick them and cast them to the side that they would never be used again or that they would fall to the enemy. We need to help encourage each other. We need to lift each other up. 1 Thessalonians 5.11 says, Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even also as ye do. We can't edify one another if we're Lone Ranger Christians, if we're out there fighting the fight or running the race by ourselves. You know, two is better than one, but 50 is better than two. That's why we shouldn't forsake the assembling of the brethren. And that only helps you strengthen your faith when you assemble, when you come to church, uh, speaking of which, there's still about 300 empty seats here on Wednesday. I'm looking around, and we could probably fit a couple on the side there, a couple loose chairs. That would encourage me, that would strengthen me if more people would come out while I'm preaching. But it not only strengthens you, to come out, but you 
could help strengthen others. That's the whole purpose of assembling together so that we can strengthen each other, we can edify each other, we can build each other up so that we can go out into the world and do the ministry of Jesus. For if one falls, the other one can pick him up. That's my translation uh, to make it a little bit more plainer. Two are better than one. Because if that one falls, the other one can pick him up. Let's pray. Father, I just pray that this message, which would touch someone's heart, would encourage someone, and would give someone strength, and would spur someone to go out and do your work. Father, we pray to the Lord of the harvest to send laborers out into the field. Not only to send laborers out into that harvest field, but Father, help us to become laborers too. And Father, we just uh, ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.